Thank you, Varro. And uh, thank you to Taivo and to the Trialogos uh, Festival for uh, the great honor um, to be here with you all today. The philosophers of modernity, the so-called uh, Enlightenment philosophers, and modern philosophy in general here in Europe in the 17th and the 18th centuries um, were tremendously influenced by the preceding scientific revolution in Europe. The scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries totally transformed the way Europeans understood physical reality and the universe itself. Modern philosophy and the Enlightenment philosophers wanted to somehow apply the principles and the methods of the scientific revolution to the political and social philosophy in Europe. They also wanted to totally transform society, just as the scientific revolution had done in Europe before. The Enlightenment philosophers developed radically new ideas about liberty, rationality, politics, and religion. The Enlightenment ideas of liberalism, rationalism, and naturalism were so successful that they inspired the American Revolution and the French Revolution. After these revolutions, European and Western civilization would never be the same. The Enlightenment philosophers saw two great enemies to their liberal program, the traditional monarchies in Europe and the Catholic Church. This was, of course, because both had so much influence over European society. Therefore, we can understand why the king, the king's court, the monarchists, bishops, priests, monks, and nuns were also sent to the bloody guillotine in Paris. These two enemies of liberty had to be destroyed. But we may ask, how could the triumph of liberty and reason end in such a reign of terror? Historians say that there was so much blood in the courtyard where the guillotine executions took place that the horses refused to go inside the courtyard because of the wretched stench the stench of blood. However, from the very beginning of the French Revolution, the Catholic Church, and especially the Catholic Popes, strongly opposed the French Revolution in France and the Enlightenment doctrines of liberalism, rationalism, and naturalism, which were spreading across Christian Europe. For 100 years, the Catholic popes, from Pius VI until Pius IX, opposed these modern doctrines from the Enlightenment, attempting to salvage what was left of Christendom. The encyclical that we will briefly study today was written by Pope Leo XIII in 1888 almost exactly 100 years after the French Revolution. This encyclical is a wonderful summary of the Catholic philosophical and theological arguments attempting to demonstrate the errors and also the hidden dangers for Europe contained in the modern doctrines of the Enlightenment. Pope Leo XIII, begins by writing, Liberty, the highest of natural gifts, being the portion of intellectual or rational natures, gives to man this dignity, 
that he is in the hands of his own counsel and has power over his own actions. The Pope begins, therefore, by praising human liberty as one of the greatest natural gifts of man. And later, he will argue that the Catholic Church has always fought for human liberty against the heretics and determinists who denied it, such as the Manichaeans and others. But then he says, but the manner in which such dignity is exercised is of the greatest importance in that the use that is made of liberty, the highest good and the greatest evil alike depend. Here the Pope states his main thesis of the encyclical. Liberty is a wonderful and powerful gift, but it must be used responsibly. It must be used in accordance with virtue and the good and law, and especially the eternal law of God. He reminds us that man is certainly free to pursue moral good and seek his purpose in life, which is God. But he is also free to pursue what appears to be good, but what is really evil and in fact harmful. Pope Leo XIII writes that there are many who imagine that the Catholic Church is a hostile enemy to human liberty, but that this opinion is based on a false metaphysics of liberty and a false ethics. That is, a false idea of what exactly liberty is ontologically and what exactly man is free to do. Therefore, we must now ask, what is liberty? Pope Leo XIII begins by making a very, very important distinction between various kinds of liberty. There are many uses and meanings to the term liberty, freedom. What exactly are we talking about when we use the term liberty? Catholic philosophy makes a distinction between two kinds of liberty. Natural liberty, which is simply free will, and moral liberty. Now, natural liberty can be subdivided into positive liberty and negative liberty. This is how contemporary philosophy divides it. Natural liberty, or free will, is positive in the sense that we can positively choose to act or do something that we want and choose to do. It is the freedom to act. Whereas natural liberty is negative in the sense that we are free from certain coercions. We are free from being forced or coerced to do certain things. Natural liberty positive or negative or simply free will is what we usually mean by the term liberty. But Pope Leo XIII wants to speak more about moral liberty. He thinks that moral liberty is the more important question and not natural liberty or simply free will. This is the critical question the distinction between natural liberty, free will, and moral liberty. But what is, first, natural liberty? What is it ontologically, metaphysically? Pope Leo XIII defines it as the power or the faculty, in Latin the facultas, of choosing specific means in order to acquire the end or goal proposed. Metaphysically or ontologically, it belongs to the Aristotelian category of qualitas. It's an operative faculty, a power. 
But what about this goal that is proposed? Freedom, liberty, is that uses means, chooses means, to come to the goal. But what is that goal? The end, or the goal, which is always proposed, is some good thing. Good is always the object of the will and of choice. Plato and Socrates taught us this a long time ago. The will always seeks good. The problem comes when our intelligence makes a judgment about what is good and what is not good. We only have the moral liberty to choose the good, to choose the true. The will cannot seek the good X, and natural liberty cannot choose the means Y or Z to the good X until the intellect judges that the X is in fact good. But Pope Leo XIII reminds us that both the will and the intellect are very imperfect, and that therefore the intellect can sometimes be mistaken in what it judges to be good. And so liberty can be misled by false good. Many things have the false appearance of good, when in reality they are bad and harmful. We can therefore choose some bad thing while erroneously believing it to be good. This implies a defect in human liberty because we abuse our power of, of liberty when we choose evil, even though we think it is good. To choose what is evil and harmful is certainly a defect. Some at this point attempt to argue that the ability to choose evil is necessary to liberty. They say it somehow proves that we are free if we can choose evil. But this, does this prove that we are free? This would mean that God, in fact, is not free because he cannot choose evil. St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us that the possibility of doing evil, of sinning, is not freedom, but in fact, it is slavery. How? He says that when something acts through a power outside of itself, it does not act of itself, but through the other, as a slave. Man is rational by nature. When he acts and he chooses in accordance with reason, he acts as a man and according to his free will. This is liberty. But when he sins, he acts against reason and is moved by another just as a slave. He who committed sin is the slave of sin, says our Lord Jesus Christ. The ancient philosophers, the pagan philosophers, also taught this when they said that the wise man alone is truly free because he always chooses the good and the true which lead to happiness, not the evil and the false, both of which harm him. Therefore, the Pope reminds us that human liberty is in need of light it's in need of strength to direct its actions toward the true good and restrain them from evil. This is true liberty, and this is the function and purpose of law. Law is the ordination of reason which should direct us to the true and to the good. This is law. The Pope refers firstly to natural law, which is written on the hearts of all men, then the eternal law of God, and human law. Human laws, civil laws, and even the natural law itself depend on the eternal law, which is simply the intelligence and reason of God, 
who created all things and who wants man to return to him. This is the eternal law of God, the mind of God. Now, these laws help our imperfect intellect, our imperfect will, our imperfect liberty to act in accord with with God's will, with the good, with the true, resulting in happiness. This is moral liberty. This is the freedom of the wise man. This is the correct use of human liberty. Pope Leo XIII says, the eternal law of God is the sole standard and the rule of human liberty, not only in each individual man, but also in the community and in civil society. True liberty in human society does not consist in every man doing what he wants, because this would end in anarchy and would bring constant strife and revolution. True liberty in human society consists in imperfect human citizens obeying the eternal law of God and the civil laws in order to find happiness here and later. God is the creator, the designer, and the engineer of man. His eternal law is like the blueprint or the manual of decent, good human behavior. His law directs us toward happiness through the correct use of our liberty. We cannot be happy or at peace or truly free without his law. The Pope then reminds legislators that civil and human laws must also conform to the eternal law of God. Because the purpose of law is to lead man to the good, to the true, which is God. This is the grave duty and responsibility of lawmakers and political authority. Now, after describing the Catholic philosophical principles of liberty, Pope Leo XIII will begin the next part of the encyclical, which is against liberalism. He says, but there are many who follow in the footsteps of Lucifer and adopt his rebellious cry as their own, I will not serve. Europe and the West would be spared. Sorry. He calls them the liberals. Pope Leo XIII calls them the liberals, and he explains that what naturalism and rationalism did in philosophy, liberalism is doing in the social and political context. Rationalism was the enlightenment idea that human reason alone is the supreme judge of truth and good. Human reason is the supreme law that must direct man. Remember that during the French Revolution, a goddess of reason was proclaimed and instituted, and later a woman was chosen as her personification. They decorated this woman and took her to Notre Dame in Paris and put her on the main altar, the goddess of reason. This is rationalism. Human reason uncrowns Jesus Christ and Almighty God. Almighty God and his eternal law are no longer the authority for human beings, but human reason is now the only authority, rationalism. Liberalism applies this principle to the political and the social context. Almighty God and his eternal law are no longer the authority that directs human beings toward happiness, but human reason alone will guide us to happiness. Human reason uncrowns Jesus Christ, 
uncrowns Almighty God both in politics and in the social order and in the individual. This is liberalism. This is the liberal state, the banishment of the eternal law of God and the erection of human reason in its place. Man replaces God. This is precisely what happened during the French Revolution. The church and the king were overthrown. Reason and liberty were enthroned. The power and the law would now come from the people, from human reason alone. An inordinate democracy would become the ideal. Pope Leo XIII says, Once we give to human reason the only authority to decide what is true and what is good, the real distinction between good and evil is destroyed. Pure relativism will be the end result. And after the fall of modernity, this is precisely what we see in contemporary society, especially through postmodernism. Liberalism has evolved over the last 200 years into perfect relativism. Because relativism is the necessary consequence of rationalism and liberalism. At the time of the French Revolution, and the American Revolution, the structures of society were still somehow built on the principles of natural law and the eternal law. Europe and the West would be spared from pure relativism at that time because of these remaining Christian structures. But liberalism opened the door to pure relativism in the West. And postmodernism thinkers like Derrida and Foucault showed us the necessary conclusions. These postmodernist thinkers said that the Enlightenment thinkers had not gone far enough. It was now necessary to totally reject Western thought and Western culture itself, both as mental constructs. Hence, the need to deconstruct them and deconstructionism. Pure relativism is the only truth. But back in 1888, Pope Leo XIII warned us that once God's eternal law is not the foundation of society, morality itself and religion will soon be rejected. This is what has happened through postmodernism and, of course, what we would later see with atheistic communism. Also, brutal force would be the only method of restraining the people because their consciences will no longer be guided by morality and the eternal law. Each man is free to do as he wishes. This will increase the number of necessary police states. After having explained absolute liberalism, the Pope now describes mitigated liberalism. The first type rejects total license and recognizes that liberty must be in harmony with the true and the good. We can think of, for example, the founding fathers of the United States. The founding fathers of the United States had a tremendous respect for natural law and God, but they were deists and only believed in religion insofar as human reason could understand it. They did not acknowledge the supernatural or revelation. This is, of course, still a liberalism. The next type of mitigated liberalism is advocated by the promoters of the separation of church and state. They believe that individuals should be led by the eternal law of God, but that the state should still be independent of God's eternal law. But this is not logical, says the Pope, because both the state and the individual are subject to God and to his eternal law. Christ must be king of individuals and society. 
The Pope then moves on to the next part of his encyclical, which discusses the modern liberties of liberalism. These are the practical applications of liberalism. Here again, the Pope applies his thesis. Human liberty must be in harmony with the truth and with good and with the eternal law of God. Human liberty does not have the moral liberty to act against truth, against the good, against the eternal law of God. Therefore, he shows the logical inconsistencies of the pure freedom of religion, the pure freedom of the press, and the pure freedom of the conscience. Pope Leo XIII says, let us examine that liberty in individuals which is so opposed to the virtue of religion, namely the freedom of worship, as it is called. This so-called liberty is based on the principle that every man is totally free to profess any religion that he chooses or even no religion. Does man have the liberty to choose any religion he wants? Or must he only choose the true religion? We must make a distinction. Of course, man has the natural liberty, the free will to choose any religion. Of course, he has the free will to choose any religion. But the Pope asks us, does he have the moral liberty to choose any religion. We only have the moral liberty to choose the true religion. We have no moral liberty to choose a false and ridiculous religion. Therefore, to claim that we have the freedom, the pure and total freedom of religion, or to choose the religion we see as best, is to also claim that we have the freedom to choose the true religion or the false religion. Human reason becomes more important. Human reason and human freedom become more important than truth. How can we say that we have the freedom to choose error? This is again the error of liberalism. Liberalism makes liberty and freedom more important than truth and good. We have no moral liberty to choose error. Do I have the right, the right to believe that two plus two equals three? True human liberty chooses the truth and the good according to the eternal law of God. False human liberty chooses what is apparently true or what is apparently good, but which is false and evil. This is the destruction of human liberty, the corruption of human liberty. Pope Leo XIII applies the same principle to the freedom of the press. Should we have the liberty to be able to publish anything that we want? Truth, error, moral, immoral. The Pope again reminds us of moral liberty. Human liberty is truly human when it chooses the true, the good, the beautiful, in harmony with intelligence and reason. We do not have the moral liberty to publish anything that we choose. This would be the total moral destruction of a nation. Can we not see this today where anything imaginable can be posted freely on the internet? True or false, moral or immoral, Human liberty is severely degraded by this kind of barbaric, false freedom. Finally, he writes against the infamous freedom of conscience. This is also a freedom to sin if we are not careful. We have no moral liberty to do evil or believe error. We must again distinguish between subjective and objective rights. The last part of the encyclical is uh, um, the last part is uh, 
about the Catholic doctrine of tolerance. The Pope writes, while not giving any right to anything except what is true and good, the Church does not forbid the public authority to tolerate, to tolerate what is at variance with truth and justice for the sake of avoiding some greater evil or of obtaining or pre preserving some greater good. Now this is another very important distinction. Authority giving a right to evil versus authority tolerating evil. God, in his infinite wisdom, tolerates evil all the time by permitting sin. But he does not give sinners the right or the liberty to sin. All authority has the duty to do the same. Authority has the duty to lead toward the true, toward the good, according to God's eternal law and the natural law. Therefore, authority can never give the right or liberty to go against that perfect eternal law, but it can tolerate the evil in order to avoid a greater evil. Liberalism is the erection of protected liberties which actually oppose the eternal law of God. It is a kind of political and social protection to sin against God's law. But this is not liberty. This is a false liberty. It is license, and it destroys the nobility and the dignity of human liberty. This is because human nature is rational, and we must act in harmony with reason and with truth. We must seek virtue and the good, for as the, even as the ancient philosophers teach us, it is only through the virtuous life that we can be happy. Pope Leo XIII writes, any liberty except that which consists in submission to God and his, in subjection to his will is unintelligible. Human liberty is imperfect. It is in need of direction. It is in need of law. It is in need of God's eternal law. The Pope says to reject the supreme authority of God and to cast off all obedience to him in public matters or even in private and domestic affairs is the greatest perversion of liberty and the worst kind of liberalism. The very first psalm says, Beatus vir qui non abit in concilio impiorum, et in via peccatorum non stetit, et in cathedra pestilentia non sedit, Set in legi domini voluntas seius, set in legi eus meditabitur dia ac nocte. Et eritam quam lignum quod plantatum es secus decursus, aquarum quod fructum suum dabit in tempore suo. Blessed is the man who neither walks in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits on the chair of wickedness, but whose will is in union with the law of the Lord, and who meditates on the law of the Lord, day and night, for he will be as a tree which is planted close to the flowing water and which gives fruit at the proper time. This is the essence of Pope Leo XIII's encyclical. We are truly human, truly rational, and truly free when we obey the natural law and the eternal law of God, God's perfectly designed will and plan for us. This is the path to happiness. Liberalism offers us a false happiness through a false freedom. Let us not be fooled by the apparent good which liberalism and license offers to us. There is no happiness or true freedom outside God's eternal law, God's perfect will. Let us examine our consciences personally and as a society and take the warning of Pope Leo XIII very seriously. Because abandoning God's eternal law and not considering moral liberty eventually leads to pure relativism 
and the necessity of totalitarian regimes to keep order and peace. Natural liberty cannot be more important than God's eternal law. Free will cannot be more important than God's eternal law. Natural liberty cannot be more important than truth. If we want a healthy, beautiful, and thriving culture and society where human liberty is truly human, God's eternal law must be at the center of this culture and this society. Because without his perfect law and without his will, human liberty will endlessly chase only apparent happiness and apparent good, both of which will only lead to sadness and to our own destruction. Thank you very much.